All right, everyone, welcome back to Investing Sucks. My name is Eric, and as always, thank you so much for tuning in. So today we're going to be taking an in-depth look at some insurance companies here in Canada. Specifically, we're going to look at the big three insurance companies, so the three largest in terms of market cap, which are Sun Life Financial, Manual Life Financial, and Great West Life Co. So I had a subscriber mention this idea, and I really liked it. I think the idea of comparing companies is something I should do more of on this channel because there are a lot of companies that are pretty similar and are worth comparing to each other. And also, as you can tell, I'm trying out a new style of video. So rather than using the TV and the camera like I've been doing in the past, I'm just using screen recording here. So let me know in the comment section if you like the style of video more and if you want me to continue to do it. If you think it's better for viewing the information I'm trying to present to you, just drop a comment. And if you guys like it, then I'll continue doing it going forward. So what we're going to do in this video is just a quick primer on talking about things you need to know when looking at insurance companies from an investment standpoint. So the business model of insurance, some key metrics that you should look at. Uh, why insurance companies are inherently different than other companies and you typically value them in non-traditional ways like you would say with a software company which we look at a lot of software companies in this channel as well and then we'll take a step back and review some financial data for each company so seven years which is what we always do and then we'll try and value each one using different valuation techniques and we're going to keep the valuation techniques super simple and understandable um, and I think you guys will get a lot out of doing that. And I'll share my spreadsheet with you guys as well. So if you want to follow along what I'm doing, just go to the uh, description of this video and hopefully I remember to attach my spreadsheet there. Okay, so on the screen, I've got kind of what the basic model of insurance is. So this kind of flow chart here. So I've got the insurance business here. And what I tried to do was show the different ways that money comes into an insurance business and it leaves an insurance business. So obviously there's premiums, right? That's what insurance businesses are in the business of doing. Now, these companies, they're not only insurance companies. They do have wealth management arms too, because they are very large companies. They do a lot, um, but for the most part, they are insurance. So what they do at a very basic level is they collect premiums from their customers in exchange for offering them some type of insurance coverage. Life insurance is a big one um, for the companies we're looking at here. And then what they do is they have to pay their operating costs. So they have to pay their employees, rent, you know, all their operating costs. And they also have to pay claims payouts so when they actually are required to provide financial coverage to uh, the people that they've agree agreed to insure. And then they invest any excess money that they either get to keep or that they have. So you'll see something here that's called float. So what float is, is basically a premium money that they have received, but they aren't entitled to keep yet because they're still liable for providing insurance coverage because the term of the insurance contract that they signed with their customer isn't over yet. So that's what float is. But sometimes they just get to keep the money uh, because the customer didn't require the coverage and the insurance contract ended. So they just get to keep the money and then they typically invest it and then they try and earn some type of return on it. So the value you get in owning an insurance business comes in two primary ways. One is the fact that typically, not always, but typically they earn more in premiums than they're required to pay out in claims. So that's kind of the profitability aspect. And then they also invest the excess proceeds. So they have very large assets under management or investment portfolios that they typically invest rather conservatively with most of it going into government bonds, corporate bonds, uh, a lot of it's in cash as well. Usually there's a little bit in equity as well, but not as much as um, say you or I would look to if we're trying to build our own personal financial portfolios. They usually invest a lot more conservatively. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of internal and external factors that would impact this. For example, let's say if you're a property and casualty insurer during a time where there's a hurricane, that would not be very profitable, right? Because there's going to be a lot of people who are going to require your insurance coverage and the amount you have to pay out in claims is probably going to exceed the amount that you take in in premiums. So it's all about balancing the risks and reward. That's really what insurance companies try to do. The best insurance companies know how or what types of people or businesses to extend coverage to that minimizes their risk of loss, but also maximizes their potential for profitability. So from that, we can take a few key success factors away. So one is basically what I just described, which is effective risk assessments in their underwriting operations. And underwriting just refers to the act of providing or deciding who to provide insurance coverage to. Then you also want to see high returns on the money that they invest. So you don't want to see them making really bad investments with the money they keep, because if you look at the balance sheet for a typical insurance company, which we'll do later, you'll see a lot of it is just assets, like investment style assets. 
And then there's also return on equity. So that's one of the more important metrics that you're going to see for insurance companies. You usually want to see this in the range of 12 to 15%. Sometimes it can be lower, um, but that's something we're also going to look at. And then down here for a property and casualty insurer, specifically one ratio that's pretty common is what's called the combined ratio. So this is basically, you have two aspects of this, the loss ratio and the operating cost ratio. So the loss ratio is kind of your claims payout. So that's the amount of money that they're kind of earning that is getting paid into uh, the claims that they're required to make. So the loss ratio will be higher for a company that's a property and casualty insured during a hurricane because they have to pay out a lot of claims. And then operating costs is just simply refers to their operating costs. So that's one key metric for property and casualty insurers specifically, but the companies we're looking at are more life insurers. So something that you've got to kind of understand about the insurance business is that it is quite commoditized. And what I mean by that is there's very little differentiation between the different insurers. If you think about Manulife or Sun Life and what the difference is between them, there may be some smaller differences that you can look at on a more micro scale, but at a high level, really what they do is the same thing. There's not a lot of difference between them. So how do you differentiate between which one is the better investment becomes a much more difficult question to answer. Now, some may contest this point and say, well, their customer service could be different and they may have insurance contracts set up with companies that say are longer term in nature, which will benefit one company more in the long run than another company that may have you know, shorter term contract set up, which is definitely true, but those types of things are pretty hard to build into evaluation. So like I said before, you can't really view valuing a insurance business through the same lens as you would say with a software company, because with a software company, you can do a discounted cash flow valuation because you can take future scenarios of what their revenue and what their free cash flow margins might be. You can very easily discount those back to the present value and then whatever your required rate of return is, you'll get a value. But it's difficult to do that with insurance because, well, for one, they typically don't have any capital expenditures and the fact that some of the cash flow that they actually generate in a given year, they may not actually get to keep because some of it relates to premium payments that they receive from their customers for insurance coverage that could extend past the current year. So you may see a large cash inflow one year, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's cash they get to keep in the business because later on, if a lot of customers start to make uh, claims, they may have to pay that cash out to them. So you guys know if you've been following my channel for a while, I'm a big advocate of using free cash flow when evaluating businesses as opposed to just looking at earnings because earnings can be not manipulated, but kind of skewed in many different ways, just depending on the different things the business is doing. But in the case of insurance, that's not really what you should be doing. And in my opinion, it makes more sense to look at earnings as opposed to cash flow. So in order to illustrate this idea, I'm going to jump into the financial statements for Sun Life Financial specifically for 2020, so their most recent annual report. And I think it'll help me illustrate these ideas a bit better. Okay, so what you're looking at here is the 2020 annual report for Sun Life Financial. And specifically, we're looking at their balance sheet or their statement of financial position. Same thing. And you can clearly see that under the assets section, they have a lot of investment style assets. So they've got a lot of cash on hand, which they need. They have debt securities, which would be things like government bonds, corporate bonds. They do have some equity securities, which is very small in relation to the debt securities, which makes sense because they want to invest more conservatively because a lot of the, a lot of the cash that they have to invest just comes from the float that we talked about before. And they don't want to invest their float in equity securities which could go down a lot in the short term and then be required to pay out that money um, as the result of a claim coming up. So they're going to invest in more conservative style assets. And they have quite a lot in mortgages and loans, derivatives, which they use to offset risk and just various types of assets. And if we scroll down to their liability section, we can see that by far their biggest liability is this insurance contract liability. So all this is, is just an estimate of the future amount of money that they will need to pay out to their to the people they're insuring, basically. So it's an estimate, so it's not going to be 100% accurate. But for a company like Sun Life, they're insuring so many different people. I mean, literally millions of people. You can assume it'll be ballpark what this is. So nothing really to worry about there, unless there's some drastic event that completely changes the world, then this number should be about accurate. So based on that, you can kind of understand why looking at book value specifically, which book value also just means equity. So this total equity here, which is just... Uh, total assets minus total liabilities. You can understand why that's such an important metric for when you're evaluating insurance companies. 
you can usually tell that a lot of people when they're looking at insurance companies, they'll talk about price to book value. So the company's current market capitalization in relation to that book value. And the reason that's the case is because book value is basically just the excess value that the business currently has. If you assume that they sell off all their investment style assets and then settle all their outstanding claims. So it's kind of like the liquidation value of the business. Now, as a general rule, you'll usually see insurance companies valued somewhere between one and two times their book value. Now that can change a lot. Going under one times your book value is pretty rare. And you usually only see that with companies during recessionary times, although it does happen occasionally. Okay. And then if we scroll up, we get to this statement here, which is consolidated statement of operations. So basically their income statement. And this is going to help highlight why I think earnings is very important to look at. So in the revenue, obviously, a lot of the revenue just comes from premiums that they receive. So that's this number here. But also a lot of it comes from investment income. So that's the two types of revenue. Remember when I showed you that flow chart about, you know, just the business model of insurance, you had your premiums, and then you also had your investment income. So their investment income will be partly here, which is their interest. And then there's also fair value changes. So they make investments in debt securities, equity securities, and they have to constantly revalue those assets and make sure they're on their financial statements at their current fair value. So if they increase in value, that gets shown up in their revenue section here, which would be fair value changes here. So it's not really necessarily a cash inflow to them because it's really just an increase in the value of those assets that they hold. But it is a significant part of what you're getting when you invest in insurance business. I mean, normally for companies, I would say, don't look at that as much, but because the investment portfolios or the general fund, as it's usually called for these insurance businesses is so important. It's such a big part of what you're getting when you invest in their common stock. You definitely need to look at it. And then if we just scroll down, look at some of the expenses, obviously they've got their operating expenses down here, which would be their you know wages to employees, that type of stuff. And then they've got some changes in liability. So there's the increase or decrease in insurance contract liabilities. So they've signed new insurance contracts, obviously during the year that they earn those premiums on. And they're also required to record an estimate of the future obligation that they have uh, relating to those, to the insurance coverage they're providing. So this number represents an increase in that obligation, which obviously that obligation would increase because they're signing new contracts and they're going to have, they're going to be required to pay out the claims to some of those contracts. So that's what that number represents there. And then there's also this one here, which is the claims that they actually had to pay out during the year. Okay, so now that you've got a good idea of the business model of insurance and how to actually evaluate insurance companies from an investment standpoint, let's dig into the financial history of these three companies. So we'll start with Sun Life. We're going to look at the two different ways of valuing them, which I talked about before, which is the book value method and the earnings method. So let's look at some information that's relevant to that. So with Sun Life, we have seven years of information on their assets, their liabilities. Now I've also included preferred shares information because what we want to do in the book value method here specifically is calculate book value per share. Now, when we're doing that, we're calculating book value per common share. So because there's preferred shares that these companies have, we have to make sure we take that out of the book value calculation. So that's all this number is here, just assets minus liabilities minus preferred shares, super simple. So we can see over the past seven years, their book value has grown at about 5.3% a year. And then they're also buying back shares. So their shares went from 611 million down to 585. So that's a good sign to see they're giving you more ownership in their company. And then their price to book value, an average over the last seven years was 1.46, which, you know, that's, a, that's slightly high. I mean, we can compare it to the other companies when we get to there, but the lowest it was ever at was in 2018, which was 1.22. So that is historically, if we look at where it's been, that's pretty low. So we can tell from that metric alone that 2018 was probably a good time to buy Sun Life stock. And clearly because the share price in that time was about $45 and it's since climbed to near $60. So uh, that's one metric that can give you a lot of information about when is a good time to get in on an insurance company when they're representing good value is when the price to book value ratio is historically low. And I think the only reason it was low in 2018 was because 2018 in general was a pretty bad year for just the market as a whole. I think um, if you go back before the, since the 2008 financial crisis, 2018 was the worst year. Now, if we move over here to the earnings method, we can see their revenue has grown historically at about 7.7%, uh, their earnings at about 4.5%. 
Again, we have shares here. So their earnings per share, their earnings per share is actually growing at a faster rate than their earnings itself. And the only reason for that is just because they're buying back shares. So that's definitely a good sign to see. And then I have this number here called earnings yield. So all earnings yield is, is it's basically just a reverse price to earnings ratio. So like an earnings to price ratio. So if you had an earnings yield of 5%, that would be a 20 PE. So it's been rather stagnant. I mean, hasn't really moved that much. You can see the higher the earnings yield, that means you're getting the better value. So again, 2018 was the time to get in really, but it's averaged about seven and a half percent. So that's Sun Life Financial. Now let's move down to Manulife here and see how they compare. So let's move straight down since we already explained how the assets and the book values calculated. Book value uh, has been growing at seven point or six point seven percent historically, so a bit faster than Sun Life, but not really that much. And their price to book value is quite significantly lower. I mean, let's see where it's been historically. It's noticeably under the value of Sun Life. Sun Life was one point four six. Manulife is one point one one. So that begs the question. Why is that? Well, if we move over and we look at the earnings method here, it's going to provide us some information on this. So we can see if we look at their revenue, it's been rather, it hasn't been very stagnant throughout the years. And in fact, it's fluctuated quite a lot. We can see here about 54 billion, then down to 34 billion, then back to about where it was before. And then it went down again. And then in recent years, it's gone up a lot. So when I saw that initially, I was kind of thought to myself, well, they're probably you know, investing in companies, or maybe they divested a current business, but that's actually not the case. The reason that it's fluctuating so much is because of just the way they have their portfolio set up. So the revenue drop in 2014 to 2015 was largely due to a decrease in the value of their oil and gas investments. Remember before I showed you guys on the income statement, one of the key items in the revenue side of their income statement is the change in the value of, the, of their investment portfolio as a whole. They have to adjust it to fair value. So if it increases, that represents more revenue, but if it loses value, that represents a lot less revenue. So that's basically what's happening here. And then, like I said, in 2018, 2018 was generally a pretty dismal year for you know, investments as a whole. So that's why it went down so much. And then in the past few years uh, has been pretty good for equities. So it's gone up quite a lot, but overall the revenue has grown 5.4% with earnings growing at 7.77%. So earnings are growing faster than Sun Life. You know, that's that's a fact. No one can really argue with that, but they are issuing additional shares, not by much, only 0.4% a year, but it still is there. So their earnings per share has actually been growing slower than their earnings just because they're issuing more shares. And then the earnings yield has averaged about 8, 8%, which is a bit higher than Sun Life, which means investors genuinely value Sun Life a bit more than Manulife. And the reason for that, and also probably the reason for their price to book value being so much lower, 1.11 versus 1.46, is just because of this fluctuation you see here. Because clearly they aren't really hedging their investments as well as say Sun Life, because Sun Life isn't fluctuating nearly as much. There is definitely some fluctuation pretty much in line with what you see with Manulife but it's a lot less extreme. So that's probably just investors compensating for that additional risk. That's probably part of it. Maybe there's some other reason why Sun Life is valued slightly higher than Manulife um, if we look at it from the book value perspective. But just seeing that alone, it tells me there's probably some, they're compensating themselves for some additional risk that they see in Manulife. Now let's move down and look at the last one, which is Great West Life Co. So Great West Life Co. is kind of in the middle. It's not as big as Manulife, but it's bigger than, say, Sun Life is. So let's look at their book value. So it's been growing 3.2%. So that's a lot lower than the other ones we looked at, but their shares are outstanding. They've been buying back shares a lot more actively, decreasing at over 1% a year. And their price to book value is 1.42. So actually, it's lower than Sun Life, but a lot higher than what you see with Manulife. So, and then based on that, we're probably going to see a lot less fluctuation in their revenue. Again, for that same reason I described, maybe they're doing better with the way they hedge their investments. So they're not as subject to fluctuate as much with the market, which is clearly the case. I mean, we don't see any huge fluctuations, but there are definitely some. But overall, revenue has been growing 6% a year, earnings 2%, and then earnings per share 3%. Again, that's just because um, of they're buying back a lot more shares and their earnings yield is 8.32%. So 
the best value we're going to see is a high earnings yield, but a low price to book ratio. So from that alone, we'd probably conclude that Sun Life presents the best value because their earnings yield is the highest and their price to book value is the lowest. I mean, the earnings yield is 8.35 here, which is pretty similar to the 8.32 we see here with Great West. Um, but just based on that alone, you'd say, you know, Manulife is looking pretty good, but obviously past what the past is, doesn't always indicate what the future will hold. Um, so we're going to dig into that a bit more, but one thing I want to show you guys further is their portfolio. So I've taken snippets of their financial reports. So we can look at how their portfolios are actually broken down. So this is Sun Life's this is their investment portfolio. So, and this is what they call their general fund, which is basically just you know, this is assets that they own. They don't hold it in trust for anyone else. It's assets that they own themselves. So most of it is in debt securities, 48%. And then a lot of it's in mortgages. They only have 4% in equities. So, you know, that's pretty standard. Like I said before, these companies invest rather conservatively. Now, if we move down to Manulife, you can see the percentage of total is here. So they presented it a bit differently, but we can see it's, it's not really that much different. I mean, they got 6% in equities, which is higher, which those typically fluctuate more than you would say with bonds. But one thing you got to note about all these companies is that they are at risk if interest rates rise, because as we know, interest rates, if they rise, they move in the opposite direction as some of the government bonds. And because these companies have to report the value of their investments at the fair value and then record the increases or decreases on the income statement, like I showed, if interest rates rise, the value of these bonds that they hold will decrease. So they are vulnerable to interest rates rising. Now, it's not really going to hurt their businesses that much, but it is going to result in lower revenue and probably lower earnings as well. So let's move down to Great West here and see how they differ. And again, really not much difference. I mean, 6% in stocks, they got 14% in mortgages, which is a bit lower, a lot more in uh, bonds. So government bonds and corporate bonds and the other two, but really nothing to write home about. I mean, no huge difference in the investment portfolio, but this is definitely something you want to look at for any insurance company, because this is really going to tell you how they're investing the money. Because when you invest in the common shares of any insurance business, what you're getting is, of course, a piece of their future earnings but also their investment portfolio, which you need to know what that is, and they outline it here. Now, one last thing I want to talk about before we move on is these companies' return on equity. So return on equity is a very important metric to look at with insurance businesses, and we can clearly see that Manulife has the lowest of the two. Sun Life at about 11.2, Great West 11.5, and then Manulife only about 8.9% um, if we take an average over the last seven years. So perhaps that might be another reason why investors are discounting Manulife stock a little bit compared to Sun Life and Great West, just because they don't have as great a historical track record as generating returns on the equity invested in the business. Okay, so now let's actually jump into the valuations of these companies. So I've done two valuation methods for each company. Now, these valuation methods are super simple. And again, I'm going to attach my spreadsheet uh, in the description of this video. So if you guys want to look at the arithmetic I use to determine all this stuff, then you'll be able to do that. But I did it for the next seven years for each one. So one is the book value method. So this method is really simple. All I'm doing is, so we're taking Sun Life here, is I'm just assuming that their book value is going to grow at the exact same rate it's been growing at in the past seven years that we looked at. I assume that their price to book value is going to stay the average of what it was in the past seven years. They're going to continue to buy back shares at the exact same rate. And then we basically see what type of a return do we get based on that. So their book value is here. It grows at 5.37% a year. Their price to book value is represented by this number. Now, one thing I will say is currently based on their current share price, which as I'm from recording, this is $68.3. Their price to book value based on that is 1.67, which is actually quite high. I mean, we saw, or we saw it was historically, it's been about 1.46. So from a historical perspective, it is quite expensive now, which naturally is going to mean if we're valuing it in the future based on a 1.46 book value ratio, the returns can be pretty low. So only 3.86% here. But this method you should really just use as a way of identifying how expensive the company is currently in relation to how it's been in the past from a book value perspective, because this doesn't take into account dividends, which dividends are a huge part of how you get 
or how you make your money on investing in an insurance company. And all these insurance companies, from what I understand, pay pretty solid dividends. So the better method to use, I think, is the earnings method. Now, the arithmetic is pretty similar. We just take the earnings. We assume the earnings grow at the exact same rate they've been growing in the past. So we're applying a uniform growth percentage. Um, just to, you know, take all emotion out of it. Take all, just keep it super objective. We're assuming the earnings yield will just stay exactly what it's been in the past. So then we get a market cap and we see the market caps growing just at the exact same rate of their earnings. They continue to buy back shares at the exact same rate. And then here's our price per share. So based on that, if we put this into an IRR calculator where we get our, so we buy the shares at the current price, and then we'd basically assume they get that stream of earnings, which that earnings can be you know, distributed out in the form of dividends. And then the terminal value here. So we get a IRR of 7%, which again, isn't that high. We're usually looking for about 10, 15% IRR when it comes to investing in individual companies. But an insurance company is naturally going to probably produce a lower IRR, especially now because we've been in such a low interest rate environment for so long that the value of these companies, as we could clearly see, is going to be bid up a little bit, which we can see that evidenced in the price to book value ratio, 1.67 versus 1.46 being the average for the last seven years. Okay, now let's see how this compares to Manulife. So we're going to do the exact same thing for all the companies, just apply the exact same methodology where we just take historical results, project them into the future. Again, the reason we do this is just to get a completely unbiased perspective on what type of returns these companies could offer. This isn't my crystal ball projection of what I think the future will hold for all these companies, because that's going to depend a lot on the economy and really just what's going on in the world as a whole. But it does help us put their current valuations into perspective. Okay, so now we're moving on to Manulife. And as we saw before, their price to book value historically for the last seven years, 1.11, was a lot lower than the other companies, which was in the 1.4 range. And currently their price to book value is actually below one at 0.98. So from that information alone, you would say, well, now would be a good time to get into Manulife Financial, but we don't want to just look at one data point. We want to look at context as a whole. So if we use the book value method, we apply the exact same methodology that we did with Sun Life. So book value grows at 6.7, which it had grown historically in the last seven years. Um, shares go up slightly because we saw that they weren't actually buying back shares. They're increasing their shares. That gives us a return of 8.3%. So that's much higher than we saw with Sun Life. Now let's look at the earnings method. Because like I said, the earnings method, I like to use more because it takes into account dividends. And obviously you want to account for dividends. That's a big part of how you get your money back in these investments. So earnings of 6.1 billion in 2021 is what we're assuming. And again, that's just taking what they were last year and then applying the growth rate, which is the same growth rate had been in the past, so 7.77%. And then the earnings yield is how it was before. And then we get, or basically what it's been in the last seven years, so 8.35%. And we can see our market cap grows and it gets to about 115 billion market cap. We divide that by um, 1,995,000,000 shares outstanding and we get a price per share of 57.78. And then if we put all that into an IRR calculator, our IRR is quite high. We get an estimated 20% return. Now, I do think that applying this method to Manulife is, it does kind of give off a little, the results are a little skewed. And the reason I say that is because if we go to their financials here, we can see, we can look at their earnings and yes, they've grown 7.77% a year, but they were quite high in the past two years. And that's really because Manulife just, has a more risk attitude towards managing their portfolio, as we can clearly see with the fluctuations. So when times are good, Manulife is going to do a lot better than Great West Life Co. and Sun Life. But when times are bad and the value of their investment is falling, they're not going to do quite as good. So I do think that this valuation here is a little bit skewed. And I think 20% IRR is a bit too high to anticipate. But you can't deny that Manulife comparatively offers pretty good value. Now, let's just conclude and look at Great West Life Co. here, see how they stack up. Again, they're kind of in the middle. So if we use the book value method, we're getting 3.7%. Um, and their current price to book value pretty much on par with what it's been in the last seven years. So all we're really assuming here is that um, the return is basically just going to be in line with 
the growth in their book value, which was 3.3% in the last seven years. So let's focus more on the earnings method. So again, we just assume their earnings is growing at what it had been historically, which was relatively low compared to the other companies, 2.07%. And then they have the same earnings yield that they have in the last seven years. So here's our market cap. And we can see how this kind of grows to about, about 41 billion in 2027. Um, we assume that they continue to buy back shares at 1%, and then we get a price per share of 47.2 in the year 2027. So our compensation for investing them will consist of all the dividends we receive, plus you know the earnings, which they can pay out in dividends, or they can just retain it in the business. So we get an IR of 9%. So again, kind of in the middle. So Great West Life Go offering 9%. I think that is pretty solid. I think all of these companies are generally low risk investments and we have highlighted some differences in between them. And, you know, with Manulife offering 20% IRR, don't take that necessarily as I should jump on this company right now, just because I think the numbers are skewed. But what it does highlight is that Manulife has, generally they accept risk more than Great West Life Co and Sun Life. So that's definitely something to consider. Okay, so now I'm just going to offer some concluding thoughts here. So based on the very, you know, financial type analysis that we just did, I would definitely put Manulife as number one, Great West Life Co is number two, and Sun Life is number three. Now, does that necessarily mean that the companies are going to have, you know, are going to perform in that exact order that I just listed? No, not necessarily. And really, when it comes to insurance companies, you're investing in their future earnings, right? Not just what their historical earnings have been, but what their earnings are going to be going into the future. And what you need to focus on is something called premium growth potential. So I put that here in this section here. And what that really relates to is how they're offering new insurance products or they're expanding into different markets and they're successfully expanding into those new markets. So the life insurance market in China this is just super basic research I did. It's grown at about 12% compounded annually from 2009 to, to 2019. So it'd be best to examine how each company is performing in China and other emerging economies, because that's going to show, can they actually grow their premiums, which would result in them being able to contribute more into their investment funds, grow the value of the business overall. That's one of the most important things. And then, like I said, one of the reasons that Manulife could be trading at lower multiples historically doesn't necessarily mean that it's just cheap and investors are just asleep at the wheel and they're not recognizing value that's right in front of them. It just probably means they're not mitigating as much risk. And it's likely that interest rates will rise in the future, which, like I said before, would negatively impact pretty much all of Manulife's investment portfolio, as well as the other ones, but more so Manulife, just because as we've seen from the historical financials here, they just fluctuate a lot more than the other companies. So if you're willing to accept a bit more risk, then you could probably go with Manulife. But if you want a little bit less risk, you don't want to see as much fluctuation in the revenue, the earnings, then probably look at um, Great West or Sun Life. That's kind of my conclusion. Okay, so that was a lot. But uh, thank you so much for listening, guys. I hope you got a lot out of this and I hope you learned something. If you are new to my channel, I greatly appreciate it if you consider subscribing. I do these types of videos pretty much weekly. And with that in mind, I'll see you in the next video.